So actually, I don't, I, I kind of don't quite know how much everybody here will know. So because it's a kind of workshop, I'll disregard the people in the audience who know something about some of these things. Thank you. I'm taking it quite slowly. So, I don't know if I'm right to think, but it may be that not everybody quite knows what distributed law is. So, uh, let me start with the, the simplest version of distributed law. So, sim the simplest, as it were, accessible circumstance under which one sees it. So, in the back of our mind, you'll have the idea that of this. Usually, uh, it's usually said that multiplication distributes over addition. So, I, I'm going to explain what this this talk's kind of kaleidoscope of aspects of the distributed, distributed law. So, I'll, I'll, I'll say what a distributed law is, as it were, in so far as it has an impact on this kind of thing. So. So in this thing, one has kind of operations of multiplication and addition, and you have to think of them as having come from two different places. So a distributive law, the usual circumstances, is that it occurs like this. You've got a category C, and you've got on C for kind of reasons which have something to do with the relate occur that will occur later. There are a couple of monads on C. So for the moment, I won't say very much more about generalizations. Um, and the I will say that T distributes over P is to give a natural transformation between the functors of the monad like that, um, together with a lot of um, uh, diagrams, which now I kind of appeal to the audience about whether they want these diagrams kind of written down. Or not. Some of the audience does want these diagrams written down. Okay, so th there'll be a whole lot of things which say that this behaves well with regard to the monad structure. So a typical, there'll be a couple of diagrams that look like this. So here there's a unit for P in the monad, so I, I won't decorate these units with them. So there's something which says that this behaves well with regard to this unit here. And there's something which says it behaves well with regard to the other unit. Which will look like this. Because those eaters are different eaters, right? But um, you remain calm about all that. <laughs> and then there'll be something which says that it behaves well with regard to multiplication. Maybe I'll turn this diagram upside down. So one possibility is that I have a t squared p, so I could do a mu p here and end up with a t p going by lambda. And here I could do a t lambda and get me to a t p t and then a lambda t. And there's another diagram which, um, if you absolutely insist, I'll <laughs> write. Perhaps I'll just do this kind of thing once. Amount of kind of visible symmetry here. So it's such that this commutes. And in a sense, I could have saved myself from 
writing all these diagrams out. If I uh, instead just told you they were the diagrams required to make the following theorem true. Okay. So the fact is that I'll just say the following or equivalent in a rather lazy way. So firstly, we might look at t alge, which is a category of all T algebras which lives over C. And we've got P here and we lift it. So it's a lift. P tilde of P to T alge. <coughs> and I kind of kind of tend to think of this as a lambda a distributivity. And then there's something which gets missed out of some of the treatments, but somehow the relationship between these two things is sort of critical to understanding this thing. And that is the, the following, that we have the Cloisley category of P living over C, and we think instead of the functor that goes in that direction. And then it's an extension of T here, and it's an extension of T, it's an extension. Um, so I don't know if it's, I mean, for those of you who've never seen this kind of thing before, um, maybe the one thing not to leave mysterious is how this happens here. So if I've got a T algebra like that, um, and I apply P, I've got to, because it's a lift, so it's got to commute with this function got to be a matter of P of A here. Well, I can get a P T of A here by just applying P. And I put a lambda in here. And these conditions are exactly what's required to turn this T algebra into a T algebra. And so on and so on. Right. Um, okay, so I think just so as to say things that aren't in the books, I'll say a bit more about this situation than, as it were, is usually said. I mean, so one important thing is that these two things come out the same. Okay. Um, and I'll explain why that's a kind of important thing later on. Slightly depending on time, I suppose. We want to finish at quarter two or something? No, let's say five two. Um, but if you're in this situation, the following things are then true. Firstly, that the composite PT <coughs> is itself a monad. That the category of PT algebras is essentially the category of P tilde algebras on here. So you see, I've got these monads floating around all over the place. So they've got lots of categories that are connected with so this is, as it were, the category of P tilde algebras. <coughs> um, so way inside here, there's the Cloisley category of free. Um, Cloisley category of this monad. And that's actually the Cloisley category of T. And you can imagine that there are two other categories which are floating around in this situation, sort of, uh, I'm not exactly begging for attention, <coughs> because nobody's ever paid them any attention, but they are <laughs> there, so to speak. Um, namely, the Cloisley category of P tilde and the category of T hat algebras. And I think, I mean, the more I think about it, more I think I won't um, try and explain exactly how all these categories look in general, but I think maybe it would be just useful, kind of, especially <coughs> those who've never seen this kind of thing before, 
to say how they look in, in this circumstance. Um, so, so, there's a sense in which every PT algebra is essentially a T algebra and a P algebra and a coherence condition which says that the P algebra map is a map of T algebras. That's a very, I've just said something which is yet another way of saying all this, this stuff here. Um, so let's just, let's just think about the case which comes from here. So if you write mon for the, uh, <coughs> the mo monad corresponding to the idea of monoids, and kind of ab for the monad corresponding to the idea of abelian groups. Okay. Then a the thing that I started by writing up is something like this. I take, I multiply out some sums, and I turn them into some sums of multiplications. Right. So, I'll just try and say what these categories are in this case, so <coughs> you can kind of have a sense of what's, what's happening. So, this thing here, is the free ring functor. So, as it were, it's free. I might just write it as a ring. So, here, you have rings, and down here you have free rings. Since I, I mean, I, I suppose it would be more familiar to a lot of this audience if these were commutative monoids and these were commutative rings, because then you would be kind of more familiar with what this is, but still kind of roughly clear what that is. Um, let me just say what you get here. Um, right. So what you get is the following. two things that you get here are actually recognizable constructions in algebra. Okay. So over here, you secretly start with a monoid. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to say X at the moment, I'm feeling very brilliant about letters. So X is a monoid. And so that tells you how to multiply things. And then you take the free abelian group on that monoid. And you just have sums of things from monoid, and you still know how to multiply them out by distributivity. So this is the objects, these are the objects you get here. And they are essentially, um, well, if the X, it's sort of monoid rings, is what you'd call it. If X was a group. something which looks like this. So the first thing you do is you take a free abelian group on a set. And then you take the monoid on the set. And what you try to do Try to say how you multiply things together in this abelian group. So what it is, is that it's a ring. So what you get here is rings with, as it were, underlying group free. (coughs) 
So in a sense, these are things that you, you, could, you see you could, you could find in the world. Um, and it's just kind of worth having this in mind because these categories, I mean, for the rest of this talk, I'll only concentrate on these categories, but these other things can play a useful role in, in kind of various kind of modelings of things. Okay. So, There are two kinds of directions in which you might think of, um, sort of moving the subject. Um, so there's sort of two directions. So one which I'm going to talk about, but kind of you know, necessarily with a certain is that we might move from what's essentially, so to speak, one-dimensional monads. So you might move to dimension two. So instead of a category, you might have a two-category or a bi-category. And you might have a two-monad or a pseudo-monad. So there are things that are like, as it were, ordinary monads, but they operate kind of one level up. And I'll just do a little bit about examples in connection with such things. And there's also a kind of sense in which you could just kind of generalise. I'm saying this in some sense just to, to kind of emphasise that these are quite two quite distinct thoughts. You could generalise from having a monads on so, uh, objects which are categories, maps which are functors, and so on, to, um, to the same situation, but to, as it were, monads in, say, a bike. say what this kind of final moral is supposed to be. Um, so you, you know that when you first teach category theory, there's a kind of frustration because you teach a category and a function and a natural transformation, and then you're dying to say, and that's a two category, mm -hmm. um, which presents you with a kind of difficulty because you haven't done categories yet, let alone two categories, but you sort of want to talk about two. And there's a kind of version of, of that that I want to promote, which is that, in some sense, before you do algebra in the form of monads, you actually have to do two monads first, because you can't understand ordinary monads and ordinary algebra until you've done two monads. Um, I think in dimension two, I'd like perhaps just to say something which is sort of by way of a little detour from the talk, which is to say, so I want to give you an example of something which is a kind of degenerate um, distributed law in the two dimensional case. So, so sort of So to say this thing the simplest way I can, um, I think I need to say something. I need to place us. So, I, so we consider instead of our category C, we consider a two category of. So 
there's no definite agreement about terminology of additive categories. By which I'll mean categories essentially with a direct sum, so say with a byproduct in the sense of So I, I'm putting in modern, um, in, as it were, this terminology, an observation of Peter Fry's, which I don't think he would ever have cared to formulate in this form at all. But as it were, the, the combinatorial point is, 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 is a thought of Fry's. Um, so, so I don't know, let's call this thing air. So, on add, there are two, well, I, I mean, up to all sorts of kind of equivalences, and goodness knows what, but up to equivalence, there are two kind of two monads that I want to draw attention to. So, I'll call one of them Kerr, and the other. So these are things which freely add kernels or co-kernels to maps in this additive setting. Okay. Um, okay. It's a fact that, that, and it doesn't matter which way around I say this. So. There are distributive laws, kind of more or less automatically. Kerr, coca, coca, kerr. And the other way around. Which are actually isomorphic, well, equivalences, I guess, technically. Depending on how you've chosen this. And it doesn't matter which of these you take, so to speak, each composite gives. So this is a sort of fact about abelian categories, which you won't find in a book about abelian categories, but in fact tells you an incredible amount about abelian categories. It's just the fact that that's how they look. I mean, so I just advertise this fact that one should know this. Where does the practice come in? Um, uh, well, it depends whether um, depends what I've said about minuses or what this additive means or something. Maybe it's enriched in beating groups or something as well. It won't make any difference to whether it's a co or a, I mean, to this fact, though. So something else will be true if you don't have these things. You don't need a minus. So I'll call this Okay. So let's just re remember about this kind of equivalence here, and I want to tell you why I, mean, why I think it's kind of so important. Okay. So it's important for what you might regard as the sort of two-dimensional it's important for what you might regard as the two-dimensional kind of models for <coughs> your logic and things like this uh, the simplest kind so I'll talk about a circumstance in which this kind of thought at, at, you know, at the dimension two 
plays a role. Okay. And then I'll say something about, as it were, the toy version of it, which is something to do with standard models and logic. And then maybe I'll come back to this song. So, so the aim is this. The aim is the following. So, if I say by category of pro functors, I got this feeling that not everybody will necessarily know what I mean. Is that right? So the aim is something like so I'll, I'll try and say it like this. So for this, you have to remain incredibly calm about small and large categories, and not worry about it. Okay. So we imagine we've got cat. Um, and for our purposes, T can be a perfectly good, T is a typical good two monad. And there's also a not quite so good, and not quite so good about size, but we don't really mind about it, thing which is P, which is the pre sheet construction. So this is adding some algebraic structure to cat, and this is doing something which is highly recognizable, and it's adding free code, adding freely or small code limits. And very roughly, um, I'm not worrying too much about all this size stuff. The category of pro functors that we're interested in is the Claisley category of P. And this is a bi-category technically, and a huge amount of, as it were, understanding of various aspects of mathematics goes on in here. Um, I'm not quite sure that I'm going to get to kind of say, say too much about it. So it's natural for us to sort of wonder when we have a T here, when we can extend it here. And in order, and if you actually were simply took that situation and tried to calculate it, you'd get into a kind of a terrible kind of confusion about what you do. So this theorem is somehow vital for understanding this situation. Because instead, so we want this, so instead, instead we look at the situation with TLs, which is some structured category, going down to cat, and we try to lift, instead, we look for lifts. So I didn't say this. I didn't say anything about, as it were, what this kind of thing means in the abelian case. But let me say absolutely precisely, kind of modulo a certain amount of pseudo something or others and, and coherence conditions. What this means in this particular case. So what it means is this. Firstly, so what does this mean? Firstly, that. So, so let A be a category which is a T algebra. Right? So let A be a T category, as you might say. A, a T category. And then I'll talk about what T is this works. Well, firstly, we want the fact that the pre sheafs on A it also has this structure. And secondly, we want something which again is sort of something that appears in elementary categories. We want to look at the Anader embedding of A and P of A. Now this preserves the structure. It better be in a sort of up to isomorphism sense, but that's okay. And then finally, something that's trickier. 
So supposing A is a T category, T. and it's sufficient to say for this, and I wrap it down into a P of B, where B is a T category, and say P of B is a T category, and this is a T map. So this map preserves the T structure. extension of this thing here, the left column extension preserves T structures. Okay. So all of these things could go wrong. A, for example, could be a category with byproducts. But PA isn't a category with byproducts. Okay. A could have an initial object. PA certainly has an initial object, but this Yoneda embedding doesn't preserve the initial object. Uh, you might think, oh, but I know that this is going to happen all the time with finite limit things, because everybody is taught in their first course on category theory that the Yoneda embedding preserves any finite limits that occur here. But that's not enough. You've got this kind of condition here. So, for example, if A is a category with equal, well, let, let me give a, a positive thing. I mean, if A is a category with term object, or with products, or with finite limits, then all these things are preserved. And it's also the case that this left card extension preserves things as a line. But just to take an example at random, if A is a category with equalizers, that's only a category with equalizers, that's preserved. If I take an equalizer preserving functor from here to here, that functor in general doesn't preserve equalizers. So there's a story about when this happens for T, which are structure in the form of, of kind of you know, categorical structure. But there's also a set of things that can happen because T can be things which isn't, as it were, universal structure. And this thing works essentially by arguments in a paper for any reasonably behaved um, T being an oil category symmetric model, <coughs> blah, blah. And actually, for a lot of other T's, which I kind of have up my sleeve for various purposes, but kind of don't really have time to explain them. So this is a kind of, I mean, this is a kind of um, an important thing, and you can see that this question of when there's an extension involves you in doing real calculations and, and kind of understanding what's happening. Okay, so just two minutes to um, advertise a paper, I mean just, just because it shows that our predecessors were really very smart, um, to advertise a paper of Ivan Berg on and Wright whose name I immediately realise I've now forgotten. The name um, of the paper? The name of the paper. Automata in general algebra. That's very much that. <laughs> um, so, um, so in this paper, this paper, in a sense, has the author's reflections on what is really happening when you move between deterministic and non-deterministic automata, and it, it's a kind of worth reading. But it also has it also has a wonderful throwaway remark, so I want to kind of tell you about it by talking about this situation in, a, in as it were, the, the kind of toy one-dimensional version. So the one-dimensional version is... Um, is where you've got set here, and P here is the power set of monad, and T is some other monad here. And then you're in a situation in which you want, so to speak, um, you want, for example, to take T 
And this is, this is in some sense what Eilenberg and Wright are doing. They're considering the question of when they, well, they don't really consider this, but they, they talk about circumstances under which you are extending this to this, and that's mm -hmm. somehow moving from the deterministic to the non-deterministic set. And, of course, to do that, you know, I mean, they don't say this, but as it were, since they do say what they say, it's hard to criticise them for anything. Um, I mean, we would be saying, well, we want to know when it is that the power set can come up here. And we'd be kind of happy about the one circumstance that we need to know this for the purposes of linear logic. So, as it were, there's a tick for t equals commutative monoids. Which is linear logic, and there'd be a tick for t equals monoids too. Um, in a way, you're used to this tick. I mean, once you, like, when you teach people group theory for the first time, and you can get them to take subsets of group and just multiply them together pointwise, you're using the fact that this, this monoid phenomenon that occurs to the power set of the monoids. Um, so, I would have been right just as a throwaway of brain mark, say, of course this happens for all linear theories. So, historically, people were looking at linear automata in those times. There was a lot of work about automaton linear algebra. Right, from the right. Yeah. I see. Yes. I mean, it's. I mean, that, that's that's interesting historically because, as it were, it might well have prompted this thought. But the thought they have is that this clearly works for any theory, which is what we would now, in modern terms, call operatic. That's to say, it's given by equations in um, things where the variables are the, don't repeat and are the same both sides of the equations. So it's, I think, where we take the operatic theories. And I see that I'm running out of time, so I won't here say what an operatic theory is because I might just try and say here what an operatic theory is. Um, I just remark that this. Kind of in interesting question, which I hope you might need to talk with friends about at some stage. This doesn't characterize operatic theories, um, so there are others. But I think there might be a theorem which says that if you do a certain restriction, I think there's a theorem that's sort of waiting in here, but which will t tell you when, as it were, essentially. So, to close, I want to go, and go back to this moral that I warned you of and um, try and say here um, what things like I mean, what things like theories really are. I think I can remove this. So, the general situation is that you could take, take as t, um, and I'll, t I'll take a couple of things as t just for example, either, um, either symmetric monoidal categories or products. And then it turns out a thing that is good to look at I kind of is we look at the Claisley category of T hat, which is essentially the Claisley category of this notion of composite here. So that's the category that sort of sat down the bottom wherever I drew this picture here. So let me try and say what such a thing looks like. Um, and then, um, I mean, sort of what, what kind of maps in here look like. So I'll take a map in here from one to one. So it's, um, it's something, it's a pre-sheaf on um, uh, T of one. So, what, what's T of 1? Well, in both 
these cases, T of 1 is a category whose objects are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and whose product and, as it were, tense product in both cases is the sum of those odd numbers. So you think of it, you think of it yourself as having a generic object, and you're thinking of yourself as u tensor to the n or u product to the n, or something like that. Okay. So, so something like this provides you with a collection of x of n's. This thing is essentially a collection of x of n's, which of those are set. But it provides you with it with a huge amount of action. So in one case, in this case, with actions of the symmetric group on this. And in the other case, with even more stuff, because you can change the, the maps between n's and n's. Right? So even more, as it were, re-indexing. So what you want to do is to think of something like that as this. It's something with some inputs and secretly an output that you can't see. And then if you look at the composition of two things in here, so I've got another one. Um, if I do it this way round, I'll take a composite, will look like something like this. There'll be an x here, and I'll have fed in some y's. So the composite, I think this is y of x, looks like that. I can't absolutely tell because I'm so close to the board whether I want this the right way around or not. But the people to whom that's going to trouble can change the order if they see that it's the other way around. Right. So if I have something, if I just think of this as a map from one to one, it's just like something on a category. So if I think of this thing as what it is to be a monad in here, which is a monoid in here, kind of thought of from another point of view, such a thing is something in which you can compose stuff like that. So, a monad in, in this my category, my category, well, is in one case um, a monad on one in this my category, is in one case an operad, and in the other case a, as it were, well, in the other case, it's what a, a Levere theory should be, so to speak, before you've turned it into a category. It's a sort of... Graph. Sorry? Graph. It's, it's a... Well, it's really a, a piece of universal algebra. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the right thing to think. It's, it's an algebraic theory. The right thing to say that is, this is what an algebraic theory really is. So. Is that the same notion that Lavier has in his PhD thesis uh, on other right theories? Okay, okay, so, so I, I, explain, I explain what's happening here. Um, okay, so what Lavier says in the thesis is that an algebraic theory is a certain category with products. Um, and the usual way to say that is to say, well, there's a full and faith, and there's a, no, there's an identity on objects functor from, you know, such and such into this. So you fix what the objects of this category are and what product structure is, in principle, and then you just have some maps. Okay. This is this is the theory before you have all the products going on, because in this case, you have enary operations going to one thing. But you don't have, as you would have in the theorem with products, the, as it were, it going into n things. Uh, I think there are all sorts of reasons why that's much better. And I'm not going to have time to explain where the, the category with products is freely created out of this in a completely simple Can I explain to you how it's complete? I can kind of explain to you how it's created out of this. So if I took a, 
a, a category with a, a theory with products in this case. In this language, um, a category with products um, is this. So I've got something which is my original algebraic theory, let me call it A, from T to 1, like that, and okay. K. And that's got some composition in it. And what I get at, what I do is this. I, I sort of move this up to understand it as something between three algebras. There has to be an action of T on A, T squared on 1. Um, this is sort of a new star. So it's the effect of the mu on the t here. That now is something which acts, which is, um, which is a monoid. It, it, this is a profunctor from t1 to t1. Right? It is itself a monoid, therefore, in profunctors. And. What do you have when you have such a thing? So, what you have when you have such a thing is you have a category with, as it were, the same objects as this category, but with more maps on it. And as it were, that the category that corresponds to that, which is actually some kind of, I can't do the directions in my head, it's either, um, because this is a, Monoid, it's either the Eilenberg wall or the Kleisley object associated with the, the, that thing. Um, that category itself is the category of products, which is the Livia theory. Um, so that, that's where it, it, it comes from. Um, so it comes out of this, and it's actually because, in Kelly's term, T is a club, this thing is already a category with products, which it wouldn't otherwise generate. What I would do by doing this thing would need completion to be a category of such and such structure. I think it's five to one. Um, so I think I'll stop. Um, okay, so so this is the I mean a, a good T that I have up my sleeve is the T for differential calculus. So you take the you take the monad for symmetric monoid categories and the monad for products and as it were the functor between them, and they're not in any category of monads but somewhere else. You glue them together to get a monad in which you've got copies of any object, one copy being a linear copy of an object and the other copy being a non-linear copy of an object. And in that setting, you've got something which, if you sort of substituted it for this, um, you could write down equations which were equations of differentiation and, and the chain rule. So, I mean, the, the, there's a kind of, op, I think there's something which is a sort of unexplored area, which is what kinds of constructions on monads, such as you already have a monad that lifts, I mean, do you, uh, I mean, can you still lift? And in that case, you know, I know I can lift it by sort of bare hands description of what an algebra 
is for this lone heir and seeing what happens. And I don't know what the general theory is there. Do you have good intuition for what sorts of structures give rise to T's and what sorts of structures don't work out and give rise to nice T's? Um, I think it's something like this. Um, but, but, you know, this isn't enough, as it were, to explain why equalizers fails as a, as a tease. But it's something like this, that there's a good... that for this, no, for this notion, it's a, there's a good notion of substitution. You think of this, the kind of thing as producing... I mean, it's somehow that you can do this in the end. That it makes sense to... Well, after all, you think of this as some way of constructing stuff in the category from things that you already have. And that when you've constructed some stuff and some other stuff, you can substitute stuff that you've constructed into other stuff, and it's still... I mean, that's a very vague intuition, but, but it's something like that that's happening. So every time you do this, what you've really got is a notion of substitution. Going back to your original motivation about distributivity, um, in Knott's theory and these related subjects, we're often interested in operations that distribute over themselves. Would it be possible to give self-distributivity a similar treatment to these terms? Well, it makes sense to say that T distributes over itself in an interesting way, because, you, I mean, of course, in a rather boring way, T distributes over itself without doing anything. But that's not really what you want, I guess, and it doesn't really make any sense. So it probably isn't a distributivity if you just do that. So, so I, no, I think, I think this... I mean, mostly in the sort of algebra, you, you wouldn't kind of think of two, the same T, so to speak. But I, I, there's no reason in principle that this material shouldn't be applied Thank you, I'll speak again.